Oscar Sharp. I'm Ross Goodwin. It starts quite a while back. Uh, we haven't even met yet. And I'm, I'm in London, uh, and I'm trying to be a director of, of, of films and theatre, and I'm trying to understand how you can make something that is classical and original and personal. How can it be sort of embodying of the form? How can it innovate on the form? And how can it still say something? That's quite a lot, quite a tall order. And it's a, it's the, the classic dilemma for a creative person. And I'm sitting, for this reason, in a room and watching an actor do this. So it's quite an odd thing to watch happening, obviously. Um, the reason I'm watching it is I'm in this workshop, and I don't know why I'm watching. Uh, and the person running the workshop says, so what did you just see happen? What was that? I go, well, uh, obviously, this is a person who's a bit worried about the shoe on the floor, um, maybe a bit, a bit disgusted by it. Maybe they don't really like brogues or Oxfords or whatever these are. Anyway, uh, it turned out that the things that actor were doing was um, a random list of actions. They had been assigned those actions randomly. Um, they'd been pulled out of a hat. And I thought, God, that's interesting, because a kind of a story seemed to be there. Everyone in the room agreed that they'd seen some little of a story. I'm like, did that come from the actor? Did that come from me? I'm not sure, but how far can we push this? Can we go further? Can we, can we make these lists of actions longer? So I decided to build a machine that made longer lists of actions, and the machine looked like this. It was a pair of dice, because I actually can't build machines, so I <laughs> rolled the dice over and over again, made longer and longer lists, and, and it still kind of worked. And I started, as they got longer, they kind of broke down a bit, so I started applying rules of, of story, like complication, resolution, and crisis, and conflict, and it, it still kind of held up until I tried to apply it to dialogue. Here is a piece of dialogue made with the dice. Copper, explain ill-fated truck neat, unite branch educated tenuous hum, decisive notice. It wasn't very good. I had a problem. Uh, I couldn't make the speech work. I really needed someone who knew about speech. Meanwhile, I was working as a political speechwriter. Uh, I worked on the Obama campaign in 2008, uh, then at the White House for a year, then at Treasury for two years. And then I went out on my own to be a freelance political ghostwriter. You know, during that time, I was also learning to code. I was teaching myself. And I immediately gravitated toward this broad and expanding world of natural language processing and natural language generation, which are the, the terms for those fields that deal with natural language as opposed to computer language. And I got really obsessed with trying to find ways to make my writing processes more efficient using computation. So I developed techniques like this, where I'd write in a spreadsheet rather than in a Word document. And if I had to write a batch of letters, let's say, I'd write all the first paragraphs together down the first row, then all the second paragraphs together, then all the third paragraphs together with one letter down each column and a paragraph in each cell. And then every other day, I'd randomly rearrange the paragraphs, uh, edit them a little bit, and hand it in as a new batch of letters. So doing that, I found I could take an eight-hour-a-day job and turn it into a two-hour-a-day job. But I, I, I was still looking for something more. I wanted to explore this type of thing in a more creative context. So I decided to attend... Uh, the Interactive Telecommunications Program at New York University, which is sort of like art school for engineers or engineering school for artists. And I was seeking a more creative context for this work. And uh, which floor was it on, Ross? It was on the fourth floor. It was on right. the fourth floor. And meanwhile, I was on the tenth floor. You see, I, I, in my pursuit of making something classical and original, I, I tried doing a story as a short film that was a, it was, it used, it was about cancer, but it, it was levitation. It was levitation and cancer, and it was personal as well because my mum uh, had cancer. So I, I'd done something in this realm, but not using automation. Um, and that had done well. It got nominated for a BAFTA, and it got me a Fulbright scholarship and brought me to NYU to the tenth floor. But I would sometimes get off early on the fourth floor into this Willy Wonka wonderland of tech geniuses where you find people like Ross uh, building, well, he didn't do this, but robot jellyfish, I remember. Uh, I remember a wall of uh, robot dildos that would follow you around the room. I'm not joking. That was real. Um, it's a very strange place, but a very exciting place. And I thought, wow, maybe I can find someone in here who can help me with these dreams that I used to have. And eventually, managed to finagle my way into a class. Right. The class was called Surveillance Documentary, and we were learning how to program pan, tilt, zoom surveillance cameras for creative applications. So, of course, they combined the filmmakers with the technologists, right? Cameras, that makes sense. But as I walk in, the thing that's exciting to me isn't the camera. It's what I can see on Ross's laptop screen, because it's a poem that's writing itself. That's right. It was a Markov chain poem. Um, at the time, I'd been experimenting with a simple algorithm called a Markov chain, uh, very old, developed in 1906. Uh, it's basically what's called a state machine. So given the current state, it tries to predict the next state using only the information contained in the current state. So how that translates to words is given a sequence of words, let's say three words, it tries to predict which word would come next given the occurrence of those three words and all the words that come after those three words in a corpus or a body of text. 
Uh, so using that, you can predict the next word over and over again to generate text. So uh, obviously, I got kind of excited, and he tried to explain it to me in exactly that way, and maybe I kind of lost track about halfway through, but I was shaking him by the lapels by this point, going, Ross, can we use this method to write dialogue? And I said, yes, why not? So I tried Markov chains on some movie dialogue, and I got results that were somewhat like this. Cloverleaf will own Toontown quite legally, so your Cloverleaf, no one hippopotamus, is my favorite genius to figure out what's going on here. Tina, Tina, you motherfucker, I'll kill you like a moth to a flame. So it wasn't quite ready for prime time, I think you'll agree. Round of applause to Ross, though. Amazing performance, right? So, so I thought... We can't quite make a movie with that. Maybe we can go back to the action stuff. And I was talking to Ross about the rules of screenplay. I said, in, in action, in a screenplay, it's not like a novel. You can't describe what people are thinking. You can only say what you see. Can we use these cameras in some way with saying what you see? Right, so I sort of thought about that. I thought about that really long and hard. And I thought, you know, how to create a realistically descriptive action sequence, because it's, it's not trivial with a computer. Uh, Computer-generated text, especially with Markov, tends to venture into the realms of the unreal rather quickly. It doesn't want to stay grounded to a realistically descriptive set of words that might apply to a particular image or uh, a particular scene. So I thought about that, you know, and I, and, and, I, and I realized that there are these algorithms that are coming into use called convolutional neural networks that can take an image and extract a set of words, a set of nouns uh, representing concepts or items found in that image by the machine. So it's a machine that can quite literally describe what it's seeing. And I thought, you know, maybe a set of nouns from an image would be a good place to start. And so I, I built this camera that wrote poetry from images. It was called Word Camera. And I, I made a web app and a series of physical devices let's like this them, one. I can just take Oscar's picture, it. and uh, it'll, it'll print something based on what it sees. So in this case, similarly, the man has a long hair. Otherwise, it has a big foot than woman. Immediately, it may journey to Europe. Earlier, it may fear commitment. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's a good one of those. Um, uh, so. So I had asked Ross for a camera which I thought was maybe going to write scripts based on what we'd shot, and instead he made a camera that insulted me uh, <laughs> accurately in many cases. And, and, and so then we get, for people following along in story structure land, a twist, a complication. I get a phone call from this man. Did you choose that? He's my boss, you know that? He's my boss. That's not okay. <laughs> okay, um, so I get a phone call from Tobey Maguire, the former Spider-Man. Uh, he had seen my film about the levitating woman, he really liked it. He's a producer as well, and he said, hey, do you want to come to Hollywood and write your first screenplay? I said, oh, that, that sounds fun. We haven't got the machine working, so I might as well do something. So off I go to Hollywood to try to do that, to try to do something original and, and, and classical and personal. Meanwhile, I was still playing with my word camera, and I was looking for ways to improve the output and to have more control over the output, because prior to this, I hadn't been training my own neural nets. I'd been using those other people had trained through APIs and web services, and I wanted to start training my own just to get more of a handle on the technology and an understanding of what was really happening, as well as just that level of control over the output. So I discovered some code on GitHub by a gentleman named Andre Karpathy at Stanford called Char RNN and NeuralTalk2, respectively, which were a long short-term memory recurrent neural network, which is a neural net that's a lot like a Markov chain in that it's predicting, in this case, the next letter over and over again to generate text. And then NeuralTalk2 is an image captioning system using a convolutional neural net. So I put those two things together to make a new version of Word Camera, and the results were really astonishing. I, I was really amazed with, with the type of poetry it was producing compared to what I just read a moment ago. And so I, I wanted some voiceover of somebody reading one of these poems uh, for a documentation video I was making. And Oscar has a great voice, so I sent him this poem uh, generated by the word camera from a picture of a clock. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, so um, by the way, it's just an English accent. I'm cheating. But he sends me this thing. It's 2 p.m. I'm lying in bed in Hollywood, uh, and I'm depressed. I have writer's block. I've been trying to write this screenplay that is supposedly going to be original and classical and personal, and I am stuck. And Toby occasionally phones me up and goes, what are you doing? And I go, I don't know. I'm not in bed, I promise. But I get this email, and I open it up and turn on my microphone, because Ross is a friend, and record the following. A close-up of a clock on a wall of four o'clock in the morning. I am not so strange and will not delay. The room is blown away from the door and the stones are beginning to shine. The silence is hardly final. Somewhere in the street, I can see the trees begin. Ladies and gentlemen, I experienced 
emotions. It was a very strange moment for me. The thing is, all of this te text that we generated before, it was so weird in a way that when you read it, your main emotion was, that's weird. But the thing about an actor is when you give them some stuff that just has enough connection in it that they can feel something, you know that you can start making drama. So I immediately phone up Ross and I go, grabbing his lapels over the airwaves, I don't know how you did this, Ross, but can we use it to make dialogue? And I said, yes. So I, I immediately went and downloaded the Cornell Movie Scripts Corpus, which is a collection of about 5,000 screenplays, and I ripped out all the dialogue, because at that point he had just asked for dialogue. So I wanted to try dialogue, and trained on that. And this is the, an example of the first thing he sent me. I was so stupid, I had to go to the party. I was sorry, and I was wondering if you were going to make me cry. I, want, I wanted to be a good man. I was thinking of coming back to the world, and I was missing something. I couldn't get the baby. So this was better than the stuff from Rolling the Dice. It's still quite weird, but it was better. And I thought, do you know what? We can do this. And at the same moment, I found out we were, we were one month from the Sci-Fi 48-hour Film Challenge run by Sci-Fi London, which I do every single year and is a really good way of getting back into filmmaking, keeping yourself going. And the way it works is you get 48 hours. They give you a title, a proper line of dialogue, and 48 hours later, you have written, shot, cut, and uploaded a movie. It's really fun. And I thought, well, if we're going to use this dialogue, Maybe, oh God, it would be so much better if it was the whole script, but I remember when we were doing Markov, you, Markov chains couldn't deal with formatting, so Ross, I guess we can't, we can't do the whole script, can we? Well, fortunately, as I said at the time, LSTMs can handle formatting, because this one was written at the character level rather than the word level, and it was able, given a complete screenplay, to replicate that formatting fairly well and differentiate between action description and dialogue. And it was really fascinating, you know, I didn't say this before, but watching these machines train uh, to write letter by letter. At first, they're just spitting out random gibberish, random sequences of characters. And then eventually they learn what words are. And then they learn how to make sentences out of, out of those words, and then paragraphs. And it's kind of incredible to watch. Yeah, I've, I've taught kids to, to write screenplays, even medium age kids. And honestly, our little screenwriter was doing it better. Uh, it learns quite quickly that action is only what you can see. That's something that takes normally five or six lessons to get into their heads. It made um, a dialogue that was sort of the right length. The sentences were right. They were declaratives and accusatives and, and emotional statements. And it was, it was kind of learning to write screenplays, even much as they were weird. And there was still one problem which is we had 48 hours and it had taken three weeks to train this thing. I was like, Ross, we, can't, we don't have three weeks to write the screenplay. Well, I had been training on graphics processing units, or GPUs, at NYU's high performance computing facility, and I didn't have a GPU to generate text with. It, it, generating text takes a lot less time than training, but uh, it still takes quite a while if you're on a CPU and you have a big model. You know, I was looking for a solution and I discovered this NVIDIA Jetson system on chip, which is sort of like a Raspberry Pi, if you know what that is, it's like a little computer, with a GPU. So using that, we were able to generate a screenplay in just a few seconds. So up there is our little screenwriter, Jetson, as we called him, because we just named him after the, the thing. So there was our screenwriter in the, in the morning, in three seconds flat, he wrote our screenplay. We managed to get a wonderful team of people on board, a great group of actors, including Thomas Middle, he's from Silicon Valley, you may recognize him. And we had some producers, Alison Friedman, Andrew Sweat, NQ gave us some money, and we went to shoot the film. And the, the the best part of the whole shoot was the read-through. Just giving these actors this screenplay for the first time, like I said, they are machines for making meaning, and you give them this thing, I didn't tell them what the story was about, and just like the actor with the shoe, as soon as they read it to each other, they'd not read it the, on their own, this love triangle emerged from nowhere. It just <laughs> popped into being, and, and everyone was laughing. It was, it was a beautiful, beautiful day. We shot the thing, cut it, uploaded it, and we made the top 10. Uh, one of the jurors said, I will give them top marks if they promise never to do it again. Uh, <laughs> another, another juror said, said the only thing that would enjoy this is another computer. Both of those jurors, by the way, were screenwriters, which might tell you something. So there was a little bit of fear involved, and actually uh, there was a bit more. They didn't, we didn't win, but they did decide to interview Jetson, our screenwriter, at the award show. And uh, this was the last question from that interview. What's next for you, Jetson? And the answer was, here we go. The staff is divided by the train of the burning machine building with sweat. No one will see your face. The children reach into the furnace, but the light is still slipping to the floor. The world is still embarrassed. The party is with your staff. My name is Benjamin. <laughs> so we got a little frightened, some of us, but we still uploaded it. <laughs> and that was, a lot of the response actually was fear. There were a lot of people who were kind of afraid. They're going, you're going to take creativity away from human beings. You're going to ruin the one precious bit of work that's left to us. You're taking it away. And then other people just thought it was stupid and pointless, that we were effectively tearing up a dictionary and throwing it in the air and sticking it together, getting people to read it out. We disagree with both of those. That's right. I, personally, I don't think there's any reason to be afraid of this. I don't think there's any reason to think it's stupid and pointless either. I don't think there's any reason to be afraid because the 
The thing that I dis I've discovered working with computational systems and creative writing uh, is that when we teach machines to write, the machines don't replace us any more than a piano replaces a pianist. Um, they become extensions of us. They become our pens, in a way. And we are able to become more than writers. We can become writers of writers. And additionally, th there's not really much of a reason to think it's totally pointless, because even text that is coherent at the sentence level can be extremely useful in certain cases. You can imagine a lyricist writing a song, and they're stuck. They don't know what line should come next. Well, here's a machine that, given that lyricist's influences and their references, can suggest a thousand possible next lines in just a few seconds. And the lyricist can browse those, maybe find one she likes, edit it a little bit, and then move on. There's no need to be blocked up. It introduces new paradigms for writing and possibly uh, new ways of thinking about writing and, and new ways of thinking in general. And helping with writer's block. That same writer's, writer's block. block I was laboring under in, in, in LA, you remember that? Well, do you know what? I'm writing something even more difficult at the moment. I'm adapting the work of a man called Ben Meserich, who I believe is in the room somewhere. Um, his previous book was adapted by, by Aaron Sorkin, who won an Oscar. That's kind of pressure. That's kind of writer's block inducing. And Ross trained Benjamin on er all of Aaron Sorkin's work. And now I can press a button and get a little Sorkin suggestion every time I need one. Helps break through that barrier. It's useful for inspiration. Benjamin writes thousands and millions even of titles at, 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 a, at a single move. Um, one of my favorites was the short films of Latbaru Starfake. That's clearly about finding a deserted planet where there's a, a, a box buried of the short films about the culture that used to live there. Great idea for a movie, right? I'd love to make that. And we, we tried other things. We, um, we trained on all of the work, the previous work of an actor you may have heard of called David Hasselhoff. And he performed a character that was really just a Gestapo version of all of his former selves, something he's sort of been doing for the last 20 years. And he did, he did that beautifully. Honestly, I think it's one of the best performances. I, I, I really loved it, and so did he, I think. And that film is called It's No Game, if you want to look it up. There's still other things we want to do. We want to build other stuff. But for me, the main thing I've learned is that, you remember I wanted to make something that was classical and original and personal? Well, I don't know. These machine systems, what they seem to be good at, better than any human being has before, is looking at what humans have done and finding a way with like a fairground mirror to reflect our, all of our past work to ourselves, which isn't that what you do when you're trying to learn what filmmaking is or what theater is? It's, it's doing that, but it's doing it in this more sophisticated way. So it shows me what's happened before, and in a way that helps me to be original because I can see the cliches and then break them. And as, as far as personal is concerned, well, every time you're inspired by a shoe or a bit of random something you've seen and it makes you think of something new, I think that's when the personal comes out. So anything that can inspire you does that. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've been... Thank a you.